Section 1 of Neighbourhood, A Year's Life in and About an English Village, read by Peter Yearsley. Neighbourhood, A Year's Life in and About an English Village, by Tickner Edwards. Introduction. If you love the quiet of the country, the real quiet, which is not silence at all, but the blending of a myriad scarce perceptible sounds, you will get it in Windlecombe, heaped measure, pressed down and running over, year in and year out. The village lies just where Arran River breaks the green rampart of the Sussex Downs. To the west, the lowest cottages dwindle almost to the water's brink. Northward and eastward, the highest buildings stand afar off, clear-cut against the blue wall of the sky, while in between, filling the deep, steep coombe, church and inn and every kind of dwelling-house little or big huddle together under their thatch and old red tiles with the village green in their midst and a thread of white road rippling through them all and up the steep coombe side till it is lost in the sunny waste of the hills but there is no way through windlecombe from the market town four miles off the road is good enough and good it remains, until it reaches the highest human outpost of the village. But there it suddenly changes to a mere cart-track, soon to vanish altogether in the green sward of the down. And therein lies Windlecombe's chiefest blessing, far away on the great main road, when the wind is southerly. We can hear the motor bugles calling, and see pale comet beams careering through the night. But these things come no nearer. At rare intervals, perhaps, a stray juggernaut will descend upon us, and demand of some placid rustic the nearest way to Land's End or Aberdeen, returning disgusted on its tracks when it learns that there is only one road from here to anywhere, and that the road it came. But these ear-splitting malodorous happenings are few and far between. At all other times, Windlecombe wears the quiet of the hills about it like a garment. The dust of the highway has no soaring ambition to whiten the hedgerows or fill the cottagers' cabbages with grit. It still keeps to its ancient, lowly work of smoothing the path for man and beast, and our children can play in it unterrorized. Our old dogs lie in it at their slumberous ease. How wild and quiet the place is you can only realise by living in it from year's end to year's end, as has been my own privilege for longer than I care to compute. For how many ages a human settlement has existed in this wooded, sun-flooded cleft of the Downs, it is impossible to hazard a guess. Windlecombe is mentioned in Doomsday, but the stones of the old church proclaim it as belonging to times more distant still. Be that as it may, its clustered roofs and grey church tower have long been reckoned in the traditions of wild life as part and parcel of the eternal hills. Birds frequent Windlecombe as they haunt the beechwoods that hang upon the sides of the coombe. They use the rickyards and gardens, the very streets even as they use the glades in the woodlands or the verges of the brooks. You may come out of a winter's morning and see a heron flapping slowly out of your paddock, or listen to a pheasant's trumpeting on the other side of the hedge. And in early summer you can sit on the garden bench and, looking up into the dim elm labyrinth overhead, watch a green woodpecker at work, cutting the hole for his nest straight and true into the heart of the wood. That the thrushes sing all day long, from Michaelmas to Midsummer Day, that in June you cannot sleep for the nightingales, that there is never an hour of daylight all the year round, when a lark is not carolling against the blue or stormy grey above the village, these things you take as part of your rightful daily fare, and are content. But life in an English village derives its charm only in part from its intimacy with wild nature and all her wonders and beauties, indispensable as these are to the daily lives of most thinking, working men. There is no error so disastrous, humanly speaking, as that which leads a man to seek happiness or sublimity 
out of the beaten track of his fellows. Neighbourhood, the daily interchange of thought and word and kindly deed, is a necessity for all healthy human life, and the natural medium of all true advancement, and nowhere will you find it of such sturdy growth, rooted in such nourishing yet temperate soil, than in the villages of modern England. Yet here it is necessary to discriminate, to mark conditions. If one's duty towards one's neighbour assumes a real and prime world's importance in village life, it is equally true that all men are not alike fit to be villagers, nor are all villages to be accounted neighbourly. It is an essential part of the life I would describe in these pages, that both the people and the place should depend for existence on the day's work, work done, as far as may be, on the soil from which all sprang, and to which all some day must return. The show villages, the little lodging, letting communities that are to be found here and there, must be excluded from the argument. Nor can men of private means, however modest, find a natural place in the true villager ranks, where, to all men, life is a series of laborious days, tired evenings, dreamless nights, you lolling in the sunshine or playing at work, or more fatal still, working at play, will be for ever a public anomaly. You will get civility, a patient, dignified tolerance from all, but you will not have a neighbour. Though you live until your feet have graven their mark into every stone of the place, you will be a stranger in a strange land. For my part, such as my work is, I have done it every stroke in Windlecombe for half a lifetime back, and may claim to have fairly won my villagership, and what it is worth to me, how it is sweetened by daily touch of kind hearts and grip of clean hands, what the country sunshine means, filtering through the vine leaves of my workroom window, and what the song of the robin that sits on the ivied gatepost without, or in winter time, comes fluttering and tapping at the old bull's-eye panes for crumbs, how the daily walk in wood or meadow or by riverside brings ever its new marvel or revelation of unimagined beauty, and how, above all, the lives of the quaint, courageous, clever folk, in whose midst destiny has thrown me, over brim with all traits human, delectably mortal, divinely out of place. These and many other aspects of villagership I have here tried to set down in plain words and meaning, believing that what has proved of interest and profit to one very human, always erring, often doubting soul, may do the like for others, though journeying by widely sundered tracks. End of section 1 Section 2 of Neighbourhood, A Year's Life in and About an English Village by Tickner Edwards, January, Part 1 1. I have just been to the house door to take a look at the winter's night. A change is coming. The long frost nears its end. So the old ferryman has told me every morning for a fortnight back and his perseverance as a prophet has been rewarded at last. As I flung the heavy oak door back, a breath of air struck upon my face, warm, it seemed, as summer. All about me in the grey darkness there was an indescribable stir and awakening of life. The moon no longer stared down out of the black sky, a wicked, venomous, bright beauty on her full-fed, rather supercilious face, now she wore a scarf of mist upon her brows, and looked nun-like, dim-eyed, and mild. The stars had lost their cruel glitter. I stepped forth and felt the grass yield beneath my tread, the first time for near a month past, and as I stood wondering and rejoicing at it all, some night-bird lanced by overhead, a note of the same relief and gladness, unmistakable in its shrill, jangling cry. 
hard weather in the country has a thousand enjoyments and interests for those who care to look for them but when the frost holds relentlessly week after week as it has done this january the grimmer side of things comes obtrusively to the fore there is too much shadow for the light it is as though you rejoiced in the beauty of sunset beams on a wall and it were the wall of a torture house you lie awake at night and in the death-quiet stillness hear the measured footfall of death a dull reiterated thud on the frozen ground beneath the holly hedge each sound denoting that yet another roosting thrush or starling has given up the unequal fight roaming through the lanes in your warm overcoat and thick-soled boots you note the loveliness of the hoar-frost at one step dazzling white and at the next a glow with prismatic colour and turning the corner you come upon the gypsy's tent and realise that while you lay snug and warm nothing but that pitiful screen of old rent rags has stood between human beings and the terror of a winter's night on one of the hardest days i met the old vicar of windlecombe and regaled him with the story of how i had just passed along the river way as the tide was falling how at full flood at the pause of the waters the frost had sheathed the river with ice and how when the tide began to go down this crystal stratum had remained aloft held up by the myriad reed stems until at length loosened by the sunbeams it had fallen sheet by sheet to the wildest most ravishing music each icy tympanum as it fell ringing a different dear sweet note and in return for my word picturing the old man gave me a story of the same times to match it how he had just learnt that certain ill-clad ill-fed children whom the law compelled to tramp every morning from reeds down a little farming hamlet miles away over the frozen hills to the nearest school at windlecombe and tramp back again every night were given a daily penny between the three of them for their midday meal and how as often as not the bread they needed went unbought from the village store because of the lure of the intervening sweetstuff shop later in the red light of sundown i met those children going home as I had often met them, plodding one behind the other, heads down to the bitter blast. Each wore a great new woollen muffler, and had his pockets stuffed. I knew who had cared for them, and my heart smote me. Somehow the pure austerity of the evening, the radiant light ahead, the white grace of the hills about me, the star-gemmed azure above, no longer brought the old elation the jingle of my skates as they hung from my arm took on a disagreeable sound of fetters though i carried them many a time after that i never put them away without the honest wish that i should use them no more but lucidly these long spells of unremitting frost are rare in our country ordinary give and take winter's weather the alternation of cold and warmth gloom and sunshine wind and calm brings little hardship to any living thing country children have a wonderful way of thriving and being happy even though their diet is mainly bread and dripping and separated milk as for wild life we need expend no commiseration on any creature that can burrow and while there are berries in the hedgerows and water in the brooks no bird will come to harm it is curious to see how nature ekes out her winter supplies doling out rations as it were from day to day if the whole berry harvest came to ripe maturity at the same season or were of like attractiveness it would be squandered and exhausted by the spendthrift happy-go-lucky hordes of birds long before the winter was through but many things are designed to prevent this under the threat of starvation all birds will eat berries but a great proportion of them will do so only as a last resort at first it is the hawthorn fruit that goes the soft flesh of the mayberry will yield to the weakest bill 
and the whole crop ripens together in early winter. But even here, nature provides against the risk of immediate waste that will mean starvation hereafter. The missile thrushes have been given a bad name because each of them takes possession of some well-loaded stretch of hedgerow and spends the whole day in driving off other birds. Yet on this habit of the greedy missile depends not only his own future sustenance, but that of all the rest. For all his agility, he cannot prevent each bird snatching at least enough to keep life going, and while he is so busy, he has himself no chance for gluttony. Other berry supplies, such as the privet and holly, seem to be preserved to the last because they are universally distasteful, though nourishing at a pinch. But it is the hips, or roseberries, which provide the best example of nature's way of conserving the lives of birds throughout hard weather against their own foolish squandering instinct. These berries do not ripen all at once, whether late or early in the season. On every bush the scarlet hips soften in regular, long-drawn-out succession, some being ready in early winter, and some not until well on in the new year. When the hip is ripe, the tenderest beak can get at its viscid fruit, but until it begins to soften there is hardly a bird that can deal with it. The roseberries, with their scanty but never-failing stores, are really the mainstay of all in hard times. It is doubtful indeed whether the birds that die wholesale in prolonged frosty weather are killed by hunger at all. Probably their death is due rather to thirst. So long as the brooks run, bird life can hold against the bitterest times. But once silence has settled down over the countryside, the only real silence of the year, when all the streams are locked up at their source, then begins the steady footfall under the holly hedge, and you must needs turn from the crimson sunset light upon the wall. I have shut the heavy old house door and got back to my table by the workroom fire. The thaw has come in earnest now. I can hear the drip of the melting rime in the garden, far and near. The warm west wind is beginning to sigh down the chimney. The logs simmer and glow but not with the greedy brightness of frost-bound nights. It is on these long winter evenings that solitude comes into her kingdom. Men are not all made alike, nor is solitude with all a voluntary condition, at least a self-imposed necessity, as it is with me, a something that I must fashion out of my own will and abnegation, weave about me as the tunnel spider weaves her lair. In this ancient house the walls are thick, yet not so thick, but that an ear strain will just trip the echo of far-off laughter. If I but drew that curtain and set the door ajar, I could catch a murmur of voices like the sound of beehives in summer dark, and a dozen strides along the stone-flagged passage would yield me what I may not take for hours to come tried and meet companionship, the flint and steel play of bandied jest, my own to hold if I can, in brisk exchange of nerving, heartening thought. But these things in their season, mine now it is, to dip the grey goose quill, to gird up for the long tramp over the foolscap country before me, that trackless white desert where I must lay a trail to be followed, whether by many or few or none, or with what pleasure or weariness, I may never certainly know, for the writer is like a sower that is ever sowing and passing on. He can seldom do more than take a hurried, fleeting shoulder-glimpse at the harvest behind him, nor see who reaps, if haply it be reaped at all. Scratching away in the cosy fireside quiet of the old room, there comes to me at length a sound from the chimney corner to which I must needs listen, no matter what twist or quirk of syntax holds me in thrall. You often hear aged country folk complain that the crickets no longer sing on the hearth, as they used to do in their childhood. My own crickets have always seemed to sing blithely enough, too blithely at times to help one forward with a difficult task. 
but I had always been glad to accept the statement as one more proof of the decadence of modern times. Hobnobbing one winter's evening, however, with the old ferryman in his riverside den, and noting how merrily the crickets were chirping in his chimney-corner, I wondered to hear him give way to this same lament. Then, for the first time, I realized that not the crickets, but his old ears, were at fault, though the little smoke-blackened cabin rang with their music. The old man, who would, on the loudest night, have heard a ferry call from the other side of the water instantly, failed now to grip the high-pitched sound. And this set me to philosophizing. When the crickets ceased to pipe in my own chimney-corner, then, and not till then, I will admit I am growing old. But though we speak of the chirp or pipe of the cricket and grasshopper, it is well to remember that neither these nor any other insects possess a true voice. It would be nearer the fact to call the cricket a fiddler than a piper, for it is by sitting and drawing the corrugated rib of his wing-case to and fro over the sharp edge of the wing beneath that his shrill note is developed, and it is only the male cricket who can chirp. The female carries upon her no trace of any fiddling contrivance. When all things were made, and made in couples, on the females of at least one numerous species, it is pleasant to remark, a significant and commendable silence was imposed. Solitude by a fireside in an old country dwelling, the murmurous night without, and within the steady clear glow of candles, made by your own hands, out of wax from your own hives. It would be strange if the evening's work failed to get itself done cleverly and betimes. Pleasant as it is to all penmen to be achieving, there is no depth of satisfaction like that of leaving off. Then, not to return incontinently to the sober, colour-fast world of fact, but to stay in your dream country, idling a while by the roadside, is one of the great compensations of this most exacting of lives. Your tale is done. You have scrawled the end at the bottom of the sheet, and thrown it with the others. You have turned your chair to the fire, put up your slippered feet on the andiron, and have filled your most comfortable pipe. The end it is, in very truth, for all who will read the tale, but for you there will never be an end, just as there never was a beginning to it. Unbidden now, and not to be gainsaid even if you had the mind, your dream children live on in the town or country nook you made for them. Live on, increase and multiply, finish their peck of dirt, add to the world's store either of folly or sanctity, come to their graves at last, each by his own inexorable road, and each leaving the seed of another tale behind. To the enviable reader, when, after much water-spilling and cracking of crowns, Jack has got his jill, and the wedding-bells are lin lan lonning behind the dropped curtain, there is the satisfaction of certainty that so much love, and one pair of hearts at least, are safe from further chance and change in the whirligig of life. But to the teller of the tale there is no such assurance. Just as his dream-children came out of an immortality he did not devise, so will they persist through an eternity, not of his controlling, and for ever they will be subject to the same odds of bliss or disaster as any stranger that may pass his door. Yet, being only human, he will nevertheless go on with his tales, in the secret hope that Jove may be caught napping, and a little heaven be brought down to earth before its allotted time. For, living in a world of law and order, where even omnipotence may not deny to every cause its outcome, is too realistically like camping under fire. The old fatalists had peace of mind because they believed it availed nothing to crouch when the bullets screamed overhead, nor even to dodge a spent shot, 
but to take one's stand in the face of the myriad cross-purposes and side-issues of an orderly universe needs a vastly different temper. Perhaps it is just the secret longing in all hearts to have at least a little make-believe of certitude, if nowhere else but in the pages of a story, by which the art of fiction so hugely thrives. I have put out the candles, each shining under its little red umbrella of paper, the better to see the joyous colour of the fire. When drab thoughts come, those night-birds of sombre feather, the pure untinctured glow from well-kindled logs has a wonderful way of setting them to flight. Let unassailable optimism make his fire of coals, for him of questioning, craving, often craven, heart, there is no warmth like that from seasoned timber. Coals, with their dynamic energy, their superfluity of smoke, their sudden incongruous jets of flame, seem to be for ever insisting on facts you would fain forget a while, much as you may admire them and depend on them, the progress and competition of outer life. But wood fires serve to draw the mind away from modernism in all its phases. So that you burn the right kind of wood, and this is important, your fireside thoughts need never leave the realm of cheery retrospect. Good seasoned logs of beech or ash are the best. Oak has no half-moods. It must make either a furnace unapproachable, or smoulder away in dead dull embers. Elm gives poor comfort, and the slightest damp appalls it. Poplar is charity fuel. Burn it will, indeed, to good purpose, but too explosively. There is no rest by a fire of poplar. One must be forever treading out or parrying the vagrant sparks. A joyous colour it is, the wavering amber light that fills the old room now from the piled-up beech and logs. Joyous, yet having a sedate, ruminative tinge about it, like old travellers' tales of ancient times. Nor does the colour appeal only to the eye. There seems to be a fragrance in it. That this is no mere conceit, but simple fact, I was strangely reminded when I blew the candles out, and from the smouldering wicks two long white ribbons of vapour were borne away on the draught. The fragrance of the smoking wax brought up a picture of the summer nights when the bees lay close to fashion it. Round about the cluster in the pent-up hive were thousands of little vats of brewing honey, each giving off a steam that was the life-spirit of clover-fields and blue borage and sanfoin, which spreads the hills with rose-red light. All these mingled scents had got into the nature of the wax, and now they were given off again in sweet-smelling vapour, such a fragrance as you may rarely chance upon in certain foreign churches, where the old ordinances yet prevail, and the candles are still made from the pure product of the hives. And it is the same with burning logs. Each kind of wood has its own essential odour, which pervades the room as though it were soul and body with the light. You cannot separate the two. No riding down of fancy will dissociate the flickering gypsy gold of the embers and the perfume of the simmering bark. If these do not fill your mind with memories of the green twilight of woodlands, of hours spent in leafy shadows of forest glades, then, then you are not made for a country fireside, and were happier hobnobbing with modernity by his sooty, coal-fed hearth. End of section 2 Please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video thanks so much.